previously, classified all groups up to order seven, up to isomorphism. For here, we'll classify the groups of order eight up to isomorphism. We'll have three abelian classes, two non-abelian classes, and the new feature is the quaternion group. Now, corollary to Lagrange's theorem says, if I have a finite group, the orders of elements divide the order of the group. So if our group has order eight, the only possible orders for elements are one, two, four, and eight. So let's whittle down the possibilities. First, if there's an element of order eight, then our group is cyclic, so it's isomorphic to Z mod eight under addition. To help distinguish it from the other cases, we note we have a unique element of order two, two elements of order four. Of course, in the cyclic group, this will be the only one that has elements of order eight, and we have four of those, which we've seen before. Next case, let's suppose x squared is the identity for all elements in the group. We've seen before, that implies our group is abelian, and because every element that's not the identity is order two, we can write this as a product of Z2s. So we'll have Z mod two cross Z mod two cross Z mod two, and that has eight elements. Note we have seven elements of order two, one element of order one, the identity. Third case, G is abelian, not cyclic, but there's at least one element of order four. So we'll call that X. We'll call the subgroup H, subgroup generated by X. So E, X, X squared, X cubed. X and X cubed are inverse to one another, so they both have order four. X squared has order two. Now, there's gonna be some element Y, not an H, and that'll give us the other coset. So we have Y times H is Y, Y, X, Y, X squared, Y, X cubed. So this describes all elements in the group. Now, I wanna show that there's an element of order two. So let's assume that all elements in YH have order four. We note if this is the case, these have all order four. This has order one, order four, order four. So there's a unique element of order two. If I take any element of order four and square it, we get an element of order two. So it's gonna to have to be equal to x squared. So let's take yx, which has order four, we square it. Our group is abelian, so we get y squared x squared. And that has to be equal to x squared. If I cancel, we get y squared equal to the identity. That's a problem. Y is supposed to have order four. This says it has order two, so I get a contradiction. So that means at least one of these elements has order two. Now, let's call that element y prime. So all elements in the group, okay, we have e, x, x squared, x cubed. I can relabel our coset here, y times h, as y prime times h, since y prime's not an h. So I have y prime, y prime x, y prime x squared, y prime x cubed. Now, by considering exponents, we'll send y prime to the k times x to the l to the order pair KL in Z2 cross Z4. So it's gonna be a homomorphism and it's gonna be one to one. So it'll be an isomorphism. To compare orders of elements, we have one element of order one, three elements of order two, four elements of order four. That covers the abelian case. G is abelian and has eight elements. It's isomorphic to either Z mod eight Z mod two cross Z mod four, or Z mod two cross Z mod two cross Z mod two. For the non-abelian case, we know we can't have all elements with order two or one, so there has to be an element of order four, and no elements of order eight, otherwise it's cyclic. So I'll let X be our element of order four. That generates a subgroup, which I'll call H, because that subgroup as order four has index two and G, 
so it's normal. Now, for our first case, we're going to assume that we can find some y, not an h, with order 2. If I conjugate x by y, we have the h is normal, so x has to map back into the subgroup. But we have that this element of order 4 must go to another element of order 4. So it goes to either x or x cubed. If it goes back to x, then all of our elements can be written as a product of powers of y with powers of x, y commutes with x, and we have an abelian group. So we don't want that to happen. So we're going to have that yx, y inverse equals x cubed, which is the same as x inverse. So what relations do we have? I have yx, y inverse is equal to x inverse. I have x to the 4 is the identity. The order of x is 4. The order of y is 2. So what I have here is d sub a, the symmetry group of the square. Now, to compare elements, we have one element of order 1, one element of order 2, two elements of order 4, and that covers all the rotations. And then we'll have another four elements of order 2 for the reflections. For our second case, we still have the normal subgroup H, but for the coset YH, we're going to assume all elements have order 4. If we had an element of order 2, we could use the previous argument to show that we have D8. Now, before we show that we can narrow this down to one isomorphism class, let's give away the punchline. So if we have these conditions, the group is isomorphic to the quaternion group. To describe the quaternion group, I'm going to bring together two seemingly unrelated ideas. First idea is going to be the cross product on R3 for multivariable calculus. Now, what the cross product does, it's going to take two vectors in R3, return a third vector. We're only interested in cross products on the standard basis vectors. So we have E1 equal to 1, 0, 0, E2 equal to 0, 1, 0, and E3 equal to 0, 0, 1. The way we multiply these, we're going to use the right hand rule. So I need my right hand. So if I want to multiply E1 cross E2, E1, the first vector, goes in the direction of my pointer finger. E2, the second vector, goes in the direction of my middle finger. And our answer is the vector pointed in the direction of my thumb. So in this case, we get E3. If we reverse the order, so now my pointer finger is pointing in the direction of E2, middle finger points in the direction of E1, thumb is pointing in the direction of minus E3. So if we can make a group out of this multiplication, it's not going to be abelian. If we switch the order, we're going to pick up a minus sign. So not equal when we switch. Now, if you've had multivariable calculus, we use different notation. So instead of E1, E2, and E3, we use I, J, and K. And then we can rewrite these multiplications out as follows. We almost have a group, so we have six elements. The only thing we're missing, what happens when I multiply I times I, J times J, or K times K? Now, the I is suggestive, so that's supposed to make you think complex numbers. So the guess is we'll have I squared equal to minus 1. That's not totally crazy because, if you'll note, we're starting our group off with a cyclic group of order 4. And one way to make a cyclic group of order 4 is to go to the complex numbers. If I take the subgroup of okay, the complex plane minus the origin, so we're using multiplication here, I'm going to generate it by the element i. So we're going to have i, i squared is minus 1, i cubed is minus i, and i the fourth is equal to 1. So I have a cyclic group of order 4. When we put these two together, we get the quaternion group. To summarize, for the quaternion group Q, the set has the elements plus minus 1, plus minus i, plus minus j, plus minus k. The multiplication is given by the cross product between any two letters. 
if we square any of the letters, so I have i squared equals j squared equals k squared is minus one. And that says i inverse is minus i, j inverse is minus j, k inverse is minus k. An easy way to remember the multiplication, put i, j, and k on a circle going clockwise. If we multiply any two in the clockwise direction, we get the third. If we go in the other direction, we get the third, but with a minus sign. Some interesting facts about Q. First, we note orders of elements. So one element of order one, one element of order two, six elements of order four. We have that all subgroups are normal. So aside from the trivial in the entire group, the center is going to be given by plus minus one. We'll have three other subgroups. So I take one of i, j, or k, and just take the cyclic group generated by it. Then I'll have four elements. Because that subgroup has index two, it's automatically normal. We can look at automorphisms. So if we look at n of g, so we're just taking all possible conjugations by elements in the group. We have a rule that says that's isomorphic to the group by the center of the group. So this is going to have four elements. To see that's isomorphic to Z2 cross Z2, I want to show all elements have order one or two. Now, if we do conjugation by the element i, okay, you work it out, you're going to have i goes to i, and then the other two elements are just going to go to themselves, but they pick up a minus sign. And that's how it works for each inner automorphism. We're going to send the element that we're using to itself, the other two pick up minus signs. Now you'll note that means each of these are going to have order two. Okay, you do it once, pick up minus signs, do it twice, the minus signs go away. So that's going to say every element has order one or two, so I have a z2 cross a z2. How about the full automorphism group? We note q is generated by i and j. Under an automorphism, elements of order four go to other elements of order four. So we have six choices to where we can send i. Once we've chosen where i goes, we've chosen where i inverse goes. So that means there's only four choices for where we can send j. Now, that means we have at most 24 automorphisms of Q. On the previous board, we noted for the inner automorphisms, they fix i, j, and k up to sign. And there were four of those. So the automorphisms that are not inner are going to permute i, j, and k non-trivially and put signs in. There are 24 of those. So that means aut of Q has exactly 24 elements. If we consider out of Q, that's the quotient group, aut Q mod in Q. So that's going to have six elements. Out of Q is isomorphic to S3, the symmetric group on three letters. So if we consider the type of inner automorphisms that we have, things that'll be outer will just permute i, j, and k. So for instance, we could have something like i goes to j, j goes to minus k, and then k would be fixed by the product of these two, so we get minus i. So to see the isomorphism explicitly, I'm going to take the coset x by nq. I'm just going to send, okay, x is going to be one of our automorphisms. We're send i to the label xi, where we drop the sign. J goes to xj without the sign, k goes to xk without the sign. So it's going to give us a permutation of i, j, and k. Now, let's go back to this business of the seemingly unrelated ideas. They're actually very related. So to put things in the correct context, there's a method for going from the reals to the complex numbers, then from the complex numbers to the quaternion algebra. So the quaternion group is going to sit inside of the quaternion algebra. And when we throw away 
the real line in the quaternion algebra. So we just consider the span of i, j, and k. We have the cross product. So the big picture here is theory of real normed algebras to show that q is the remaining isomorphism class. We first present q in terms of generators and relations. Now, we know we can describe q with two generators. So we did it before with i and j. Let's call them x and y. Then we'll need x has order 4, x squared equals y squared, so y also has order 4, and yx, y inverse equals x inverse, or conjugation of x by y is x inverse. This says our group is not abelian. Now, what this means, if I have a group, I can find two generators that satisfy these relations, we can construct an isomorphism from our group to Q by setting X equal to I and Y to J. Then we get the original group isomorphic to Q. Now, let's go back to our previous situation. We had subgroup H, okay, so we had E, X, X squared, X cubed, index two, so normal in G, which has order eight. The other elements are gonna be in the form y, yx, yx squared, yx cubed, where y is not an h. We're assuming that these all have order four. Now, if these are all of order four, as we saw before, order one, order four, order four, so we have a unique element of order two. If we take any element of order four and square it, we get an element of order two. So we're gonna have that y squared is equal to the unique element of order two, which is x squared. So that's one of our relations. Now, we also saw this before. If I consider y, x, y inverse, so we're just conjugating x by y, we know that h is normal, so this element x gets carried back into the subgroup h. There are only two elements of order four in there, so we can go to either x or x cubed. If we go to x, we have an abelian group because we can write every element as products of x and y. So we'll want y, x, y inverse equal to x cubed, which is the same as x inverse. So we get our other relation, and that shows that we're isomorphic to q.